Tina Koto Katoa Fakato Anawaho Namihi o Tine Po. Uh, takune uh, Emihiana Kiakwe Professor Waldron. No mai haru mai tine tato katoa. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure this evening to introduce our 2017 Sir John Graham lecturer, Professor Jeremy Waldron. It's, it's a huge honour to be here again for the second time uh, for the John Graham lecture. I want to give a special word of gratitude to Alex Pink, who has um, been looking after me these few days, who I've known now for 10 or 12 years, and, and um, to Ella and Salmi, and to all at the Maxim Institute. I, I really appreciate. I appreciate the work that the Law Foundation and the Auckland University of Technology have done to support this event as well. Um, like others, this evening I want to convey my best wishes to Sir John and Lady Graham. As Nikki said, I delivered the inaugural lecture in 2008, and I'd like to repeat what I said about Sir John at that time. I said, Sir John, I said John Graham, who was plain Mr. John Graham in those days. John Graham is a household name in New Zealand. He stands for a dignity and a greatness in public life and in educational and sporting affairs that is emulated all too rarely today. It was a privilege to meet him on that occasion. It's a um, a deep honour to stand here uh, for a lecture delivered in his name and dedicated to the work of this institute that I now feel I know so well. So thank you very much for having me here this evening. A lot has happened since that first lecture. Sir John, as I said, was just plain Mr. Graham, Mr. Graham CBE, but Mr. Graham nonetheless in those days. Helen Clark, I think, was Prime Minister in New Zealand. George W. Bush, was President of the United States, and as Nikki mentioned, in July 2008, the election of Barack Obama to the American presidency was still just a hope and a possibility. Who could have foreseen a Trump administration or the Brexit vote in the United Kingdom or the rage and nationalist resentment that inspired the Orban presidency in Hungary and the powerful populist candidacies of Marine Le Pen in France and Geert Wilders in the Netherlands. Le Pen winning 35% of the popular vote cannot be dismissed. When I spoke in 2008, I addressed a specifically New Zealand theme, which was the decline of legislative due process in the New Zealand House of Representatives. But I've lived outside New Zealand now for almost 40 years. Will you indulge me this time if I take up a mainly American theme and talk about matters of American, American politics? Because what I want to do is bring to you a report, a letter from America, from the battered ramparts of collapsing civility in American politics. A report which I hope will have some lessons for New Zealand, but which in the age of President Trump exerts a terrible fascination in its own right. So this is going to be a, a, a letter from America. Six weeks ago, an individual name of James Hodgkinson, who said he was fed up with the Trump administration, took a rifle and a handgun to a ballpark in Alexandria, Virginia, and he fired his long gun at a bunch of people who were practicing for an upcoming baseball game. The baseball game was the annual charity event organized by members of the United States Congress. It's a little bit like the parliamentary cricket game uh, in New Zealand. And the people practicing were members of the Republican Party team who were due to meet their Democrat counterparts for the actual match the next day. Mr. Hodgkinson shot four people and was himself shot dead by police who arrived quickly at the scene. The most seriously injured of his victims, House Majority Whip Steve Scalise of Louisiana, almost died of his wounds. Um, he's been in hospital since then. He was released from hospital, I believe, yesterday or the day before. Time difference always screws me up, but, but um, he was in intensive care for weeks. The baseball game between the two parties took place as scheduled, and you'll be pleased to hear that the Democrats won by a margin of 11 to 2. <laughs> Needless to say, the incident gave rise to a great many published expressions of concern. 
concern about the impact of the rage and incivility that now seem to be a settled feature of American politics. Of course, Mr. Hodgkinson was a disturbed individual, but disturbed individuals are not uncommon in the United States, and the concern was about the emotional and political background against which a particular individual disturbance plays out, which, against which it occurs to a disturbed individual like Mr. Hodgkinson to act out his anger and resentment. He belonged to a Facebook group called Terminate the Republican Party. He had in the past advocated the legal removal of President Trump for treason. And a week or two earlier, he had posted something on Facebook saying, Trump is a traitor. He has destroyed our democracy. It's time to destroy Trump and company. The shooting is an anomaly, but Hodgkinson's sentiments, I'm afraid, are quite common in the United States. His sentiments about treason, sentiments about the need to get rid of the president. The political atmosphere in the United States has been poisoned by incivility on both sides, and that's what I want to reflect about this evening. America is a big, crowded, violent country, more violent than any other advanced democracy. It has a population of about a quarter of a billion heavily armed and highly opinionated individuals. <laughs> Most of them on drugs. <laughs> All of them enraged and resentful. <laughs> snarling and muttering at each other and professing the utmost offense at each other's convictions. Um, it is funny, but it is true. In their 2017 poll, um, a group called Civility in America found that 75% of Americans believe that incivility in the US has risen to crisis levels, although 94% of respondents said that they themselves were always civil to others. <laughs> Everyone laments the fury with which hyper-partisan American politics is conducted, but they place the blame for incivility always at the door of their opponents. They deny, they deny, we deny, that our incivility is anything like as bad as our opponents, and we indulge the infantile refrain, he started it, yeah? Trump started it, or Hillary started it, as though the issue were one of blame rather than consequence. Neither side believes that they can afford to pull back from their own incivility, lest they be taken for suckers by the continued uncivil behavior of their opponents. There's a simmering potential for violence. Uh, the 2016 presidential campaign was disfigured by scuffles and beatings at political rallies. Candidate Trump yearned out loud for what he called the good old days when you could punch hecklers in the face. He said, you know what they used to do to guys like that when they were in a place like this, folks? They'd be carried out on a stretcher. In May of this year, Greg Gianforte, a successful Republican candidate for Congress from Montana, had to be convicted of assault after he body slammed a reporter to the floor, Ben Jacobs, a reporter for The Guardian, after Jacobs had asked an inc inconvenient question about Republican health care. We haven't yet seen fisticuffs and furniture throwing in the House of Representatives, which you see in countries like Turkey or Venezuela, uh, not here, I hope. But warnings have been sounded that we are flirting with this sort of violence with the level of rhetoric that is being used in the chamber. Is it hyperbole to say that we've been this way before? In 1856, a South Carolina representative attacked an abolitionist senator from Massachusetts, Charles Sumner, attacked him with a gold-tipped walking stick to avenge criticism that Sumner had made of the representative's cousin, another Carolinian senator, for, quote, choosing as his mistress the harlot slavery. The cane splintered with the force of the blows that being rained down, rained down on Sumner, and Sumner had to rip his desk loose from the bolts holding it to the floor in an effort to escape. He was rendered unconscious. He couldn't come back into the Senate to resume his, his um, uh, duties for three years. Now that was, that's historical, it's a long time ago. Somebody once taught me to count historical time in generations rather than years, so that was seven generations ago. And when you put it that way, 
It's not all that long ago. Seven generations, five years before the beginning of a civil war in the United States about a moral issue called slavery, on which opinions were vehement and tempers were short, which ended up claiming the lives of 600,000 um, Americans. I doubt that we are in the danger of a second civil war, but there was a first, and it didn't come out of nowhere. It came out of a background where people were beginning to be increasingly uncivil and beginning increasingly to intimate and then act out violence towards each other. And anyway, incivility in politics is dangerous for itself, not just for what it may lead to. Um, as Senator Marco Rubio of Florida warned the modern chamber, he said, I don't know of a civilization in the history of the world that's been able to solve its problems when half the people in the country absolutely hate the other half of the people in that country. All of this is worth, worth thinking about. Is this incivility a problem in New Zealand? I hear mixed reports. Back in the day when I left New Zealand in the 1970s, it was the time of Citizens for Rolling. You remember it was a campaign to portray Robert Muldoon as a fascist? It was the time of the Colin Moyle affair with ill-tempered, alcohol-fueled exchanges in the House of Representatives. I myself helped organize some irresponsibly unruly demonstrations in Dunedin. <laughs> Uh, people were gearing up for the violence of the 1981 Springbrook tour. New Zealand has had its moments. But on the other hand, um, when I asked um, Alex and his staff to give me examples of current political incivility in New Zealand, those seem to drift mainly between failures of courtesy and trivialization of politics by the news media. I do think New Zealanders have tried to do their share in sustaining an uncivil attitude towards the Trump administration in the United States. Apparently a poll showed that only 15% of New Zealanders would have voted for Donald Trump if they'd been offered the opportunity, to which the response would be, how has it got to do with you? But um, as you know, when US Secretary of State Rex Tillerson visited Wellington last month, he had to drive by large numbers of New Zealanders greeting him rudely in the rain with their middle fingers extended. A New York Times reporter said, I've been in motorcades for a couple of years now, but I've never seen so many people flip the bird <laughs> at an American motorcade as I saw today, flipping the bird as an American expression. But that's pretty mild stuff. It's self-satisfied rudeness more than anything else. I believe that politics in New Zealand remain pretty civil. Perhaps I'm wrong, I don't have to live here and we can talk about this, I hope, at question time. But this is not really incivility on the scale that we're experiencing in the United States. And if that's right, then well and good. Keep it that way. And my remarks this evening are intended only to indicate in this letter from America how hard a task the retrieval of civility is proving to be if ever you lose your grip on it. You can walk away from it really easy. Walking it back is the hardest thing in the world, and that's, I think, what we are seeing and what we are going to see in the United States. So let's think a little bit about civility. Should we try to define civility? I'm not sure. It's easy enough to recognize incivility. It's one of those virtues that we can see the opposite more clearly than we can define the presence of the thing itself. We know incivility when we see it. Examples abound where hyperpartisanship leads to personal aspersions and vulgar abuse, and where any dispassionate observer will discern an unpleasant intimation, if not the acting out of violence. So, for example, let me give you six or eight examples. Every morning, I run into the man with a fuck Trump sign permanently installed outside the West 4th Street subway <laughs> on 6th Avenue. At candidate Trump's rallies during the campaign, his supporters denounced Hillary Clinton, chanting, as you know, lock her up, and wearing t-shirts uh, with the slogan, Trump that bitch. Um, for her part, Secretary Clinton used the phrase, a basket of deplorables, to describe those of her fellow citizens who were disposed to vote for her opponent. She said, you could put half of Trump's supporters in what I call the basket of deplorables, right? The racist, sexist, homophobic, xenophobic, Islamophobic, you name it, he has lifted them all up. 
Candidate Trump, you remember, mocked a disabled reporter at one of his presidential, as, at one of his press conferences, and you remember too his vulgar comments about women reporters bleeding, both during the campaign and in the course of his presidency. A number of Democratic representatives and senators turned their backs on First Lady Melania Trump when she entered the chamber for her husband's address to the joint session of Congress last February. A writer in the New Yorker defended this discourtesy, saying that in times like these, the withholding of ordinary graciousness may be the least that one can do. A few weeks ago, New York Times columnist Charles Blow said this about President Trump on the op-ed page of the New York Times. He said, a madman and his legislative minions are holding, New York, are holding America hostage. And he continued, Trump is an abomination and a cancer on the country and none of us can rest until he is no longer holding the reins of power. Steve Bannon, a close advisor to President Trump in the administration and during the campaign, said when it wasn't clear whether Trump would actually prevail in the contest, he says, our second best, our backup strategy is to fuck up Hillary Clinton so badly that she cannot govern. <coughs> Leon Wieseltier, calling Trump a foul and repulsive demagogue, counseled readers of the Washington Post to stay angry, cautioning them that it's possible to get used to anything, and if you don't stop, take steps to prevent it, you will get used to Trump. Democracies fall, he said, when people stop resisting. So these are the recognizable phenomena of political incivility, and much as I hate to say it, they can be recognized on both sides of the aisle. As I mentioned, it's easy to say what civility is not. It includes discourtesy, and I've given you some examples of discourtesy, the Rex Tillerson greeting, the discourtesy to the First Lady when she entered the Senate chamber. But I don't know that it's just a matter of politeness. The American columnist Judith Martin, who some of you will know writes under the nom de plume of Miss Manners, has a book on civility, but most of it's about etiquette at the dinner table and on dates, and it's tied down to an outdated sense of delicacy in sexual relations, which, as the author acknowledges, is still coming to terms with the fact that body parts can be used for things other than writing thank you notes. And, uh, <laughs> so I don't know how to define civility. It's not just niceness. Gandhi once said that civility means an inborn gentleness and a desire to do the opponent good. But that's wrong, I think. Civility is not a warm virtue. It's a chilly virtue. It's a matter of showing respect in relatively formal ways. I associate it with formality, with a willingness to respect the formalities of an interaction and to put one's feelings towards the person you're dealing with, whether they are warm feelings or hostile feelings, to one side so that you subordinate them to the rules that are prescribed for the interaction. It comprises forms of speech and interaction that distinguish dealing with an enemy from dealing with an opponent. I think that's absolutely crucial. We disagree, we disagree about everything, but we have to be able to distinguish between dealing with our opponents within the citizenry and dealing with an enemy uh, with whom we would want to approach with violence. So it comprises forms of speech and interaction that distinguish dealing with an enemy from dealing with an opponent, that is a fellow citizen with whom you stand in an adversarial relation, but not a relation of complete hostility. And it's the blurring of that distinction between enemy and opponent that we seem to be seeing today. I have a, a, a number, you know, I, I work in a university, so I have a number of postmodern academic colleagues who disparage civility as a hegemonic ideal. They say it's the etiquette of the powerful, the white, and the male calculated to subdue, pacify, and humiliate subaltern populations. It's a way in which Western manners are imposed on outsiders and savages, a way in which the resistance of those being subjugated by Europeans is stigmatized as a failure of civilization. I'm not convinced by that. I think it is true that in a diverse and pluralistic society, we are likely to find different mores and different customs of civility different ways of marking this distinction between opponent and enemy, just as we find different forms of etiquette. But we, and, and we have to get used to the variety of different formalities that are used by our fellow citizens to distinguish political adversaries from hostile enemies. 
but some such distinction there must be in anything that calls itself a democracy. In any community where there is disagreement, but which is a democracy, some such distinction there must be between an adversary and an enemy. And there must be ways of marking it, which of course are going to be culturally defined and which are going to vary from culture to culture. But people need to learn and practice ways of marking this distinction between I'm dealing with an opponent and I'm dealing with an enemy. There must be ways of marking it and using that to tone and condition one's mode of political engagement. I read somewhere that Australian politicians compare the toxic incivility of their own politics with the relative civility of politics in New Zealand. So you guys are being envied by your Australian counterparts. Is that justified? Again, I don't know, and I hope to get some guidance at um, question time. But in 2010, the Sydney Morning, Morning Herald reported Julia Gillard pleading for a new era of civility in the Australian Parliament, urging opposition parties to put aside the empty rancor of partisanship and work together with Labour for the betterment of the people. Tony Abbott rejected the notion. He said, I don't think that what we should aim for is some kind of spurious consensus. Our system is an adversarial system. And Abbott is right about that. Modern democracy does indeed work as an adversarial system. We have to be able to voice our disagreements. We have to be able to lock in to uh, debate and serious um, uh, uh, adversarial disagreement about public policy. And if there's one thing I want to argue for this evening, in the midst of this plea for civility, it is that consensus is not the key to civility. Finding common ground is not the key to civility. We have to look for civility in the midst, in the middle of our disagreements, not in any proposal for superseding our disagreements. Civility is about the way we deal with our disagreements, not about the way we avoid them. I mean, of course, there are settings like the dinner table where you try to avoid religious disputes and political disputes, and that, as a matter of etiquette, is important. But in politics, we have to air our disagreements, and we have to find ways of giving vent to our disagreements that do not involve disparaging or hitting or denigrating the person that we disagree with. Certainly, and now I'm gonna get it just a little bit practical. Certainly the problem of incivility is not solved by taking divisive issues out of the rough and tumble of politics so that they're no longer up for grabs in majority voting, but rather dealt with on a higher plane in the hallowed halls of our judicial system. It's not solved by trying to constitutionalize some issues, take them out of politics, give them to the courts. It's true that in the uh, logic of constitutionalization, the idea of the Constitution, as the US Supreme Court once said, is to withdraw certain subjects from the vicissitudes of political controversy because they're too dangerous, politics. But I actually believe this contributes to incivility. When you take an issue like, I don't know, same-sex marriage or abortion, and you take it out of politics, which dealt with it perfectly well in New Zealand, and you consign it to the courts, effectively you're saying to one side on that issue, your view is so wrong it shouldn't even have the opportunity to be voted on. That's what you're saying. You're saying your view is so far beyond the pale that it shouldn't even be uh, on the agenda for ordinary politics. And that form of denunciation, I think, is, is, is actually contributes to incivility. I know this is a counterintuitive approach. After all, what could be more civil than dealing with a divisive issue in the decorous surroundings of a courtroom? But I reached this position reflecting on our experience in the United States with the constitutionalization of the politics of abortion. Um, you'll remember that in 1973, there was a decision called Roe against Wade which purported to settle the matter of abortion on a non-partisan basis, settle it in court, settle it by voting among judges rather than voting among representatives. Do you know somebody called the comedian John Stewart? Yeah. So John Stewart wrote a book, uh, A Guide to American Democracy, America, the book, A Citizen's Guide to Democracy. And 
he went through great landmarks of American constitutional history. And when he came to 1973, he said this was the year of the decision in Roe against Wade in which the court ruled that the right to privacy protects a woman's decision to have an abortion and established that the fetus is not a person with constitutional rights, thus ending all debate on this once controversial issue. <laughs> right? Fat chance. Politically and culturally, Roe against Wade didn't settle anything. The politics of the issue has continued to fester and ferment in civil society, in rage and demonstrations, not to mention unpleasantness and homicidal violence. The fact that the, the fact, despite the fact that the constitutionalization of the issue um, took it out of ordinary political procedures, it led to the pro-life people being stigmatized as unworthy of even the prospect of legislative or electoral success. And our experience in the United States with abortion shows that very quickly, if you take stuff out of politics and put it in the realm of the courts, what you end up doing is politicizing the courts. Yeah? Politics doesn't go away. The judges start snarling and muttering with great hostility to one another in the way that my friend Nino Scalia and his more liberal brethren on the bench used to snarl and mutter to each other. And there's a cons consequent and poisonous politicization of the process of judicial appointments. So I just want to d just dwell on this just for a moment longer. Constitutionalization of an issue, taking it out of electoral politics, giving it to the courts, has a kind of winner-takes-all logic. A victory in court leads to a claim that the losing party should never have held its position in the first place. Its position doesn't just fail politically, as almost every policy does at some time in its career, but it's denounced as being beyond the limits of decent politics. And the mood and tone of this denunciation is quite different from that of an ordinary political or legislative victory where everyone knows that the tables may be turned after the next vote or the next election. It does damage to the rhythm and the fabric of politics. The English philosopher Bernard Williams once reflected on the difference between being able to say to a losing opponent, you lost, and being able to say to a losing opponent, you were wrong. Saying, well, you lost is compatible with recognizing his position as honest and honorable, even though you disagree with it. It's almost like saying, better luck next time. It recognizes that we share civil space with our opponents and our aim is to defeat their positions, not demonize their persons. It's one of the reasons why Bernard Williams was so opposed to the moralization of politics. And it's one thing to remember, the stronger the level of moralization, the stronger the self-righteousness with which people conduct their political campaigns, the more they will be tempted to demonize their opponents and the less they will be able to find ways of treating their opponents with civility and respect. So that's one of the reasons that I'm skeptical about proposals to introduce strong constitutional judicial review of legislation into the New Zealand political structure. I know this has been intimated in Sir Geoffrey Palmer and Andrew Butler's suggestions for constitutional reform. I think we need to be very careful about this. It's a way of taking divisive issues out of politics, sure, but it's also a way of demonizing one of the sides in an ongoing disagreement. And that demonization, that trying to take away our rights, is inherently uncivil. And I say, think very carefully before constitutionalizing a divisive issue. Give all parties a chance for a vote. Um, one of the things I do to the eternal irritation of my colleagues in the United States is to show that wonderful scene at the end of the third reading vote on the same-sex marriage bill in New Zealand. House of Representatives, the joyous singing and so on. This is what it looks like, I say, when it's done legislatively, where both sides have the opportunity to convince as many representatives as, follow, as, as possible, and where each side can feel respected, even though one of the sides has to lose, as opposed to a judicial victory, where one of the sides is effectively demonized. So when people disagree in good faith on a deeply felt issue, it's exactly, I think, the wrong move to try to entrench one's own position constitutionally and put opposing positions beyond the pale. As I said, it's part of my um, <clears throat> intention this evening to insist that we have to acknowledge and cope with the existence of 
deeply rooted disagreements in our society. It's always disconcerting to find that your own absolutes, your own moral convictions are not shared by others. In the years after 9-11, when the United States found itself embroiled in debate about torture and in the practice of torture, I was amazed to find that most of my philosophical colleagues disagreed with my absolutist opposition to torture. They thought I must be some sort of religious maniac to want to justify an absolutist position, and they didn't think it was possible rationally to justify it. And I had to come to terms with the fact that the world in which I lived, inhabited by these millions of other people, wasn't necessarily a world controlled by the passions, no doubt the correct passions, uh, <laughs> of Jeremy Waldron. <laughs> When we confront intractable opposition on a position, on a view that we regard as morally serious, it's tempting to diagnose the opposition as something else. It must be the product of irrationality or prejudice, or it must be motivated by self-interest. We say, how else could they possibly come up with a view so much at odds with my own? There must be some special, some special um, explanation, and we cultivate a sort of politics of suspicion of the motives of those who disagree with us. For years in my work, I've argued that we need to get over this tendency. Different conceptions of the world can reasonably be elaborated from different standpoints, and diversity arises in part from our distinct perspectives. It's unrealistic to suppose that all our differences are rooted solely in ignorance and perversity, or else in the rivalries for power, or status, or economic gain. That's John Rawls, and I think it's very important to insist on this, that. There are so many of us, and we come from such different experiences and perspectives that we've got to expect that on complex issues, reasonable people will disagree. And we can say that without having to lose faith in the power of our own convictions. Distinctions of perspective in this regard include religious differences. Now, religion plays a greater role in American politics than it does in a basically secular country like New Zealand. I'm not one of those who believes that for the sake of civility, religious differences should be muted, muted, muted in politics. We need to be able to call it like it is, and those who hear us need to be able to get used to hearing religiously motivated views, and they need to strain and understand our religiously motivated positions as we strain to understand the dignity of their secular moral principles. If people can learn to talk frankly and without embarrassment about their most compelling convictions, then perhaps we can diminish some of the resentment that is associated with the perception that in a garrulous polity, some people are being silenced. President Obama, of whom I am a great admirer, talked one day disparagingly about people stuck with their guns and their religion. It was a wrong way to, to disparage them. People, I'm not sure about their guns, but people cherish, obviously, their religion, and it needs to be taken seriously. I know that religion will make political disagreements more intractable, but it need not make them more uncivil. We have to learn to live with the, the deep basis of our disagreements and not see it as a ground for screaming at each other. All of us think of ourselves as good persons. Each of us associates his or her political views with a certain amount of self-righteousness. Each of us wants to use our deeply felt moral views to direct the world. But here we are, even in this room, there are 200 of us with different views. We share the world for politics. We have politics because not one person, but people inhabit the world. As Hannah Arendt put it once, not man, but men inhabit the world and make a life between them. And our politics has to be worked out in that forum. There's no need to abandon strong feelings. The procedures of politics are often associated with arts and conventions of rhetoric which provide a language appropriate to the vehemence that the opponent of a view may feel called upon to, to um, express. Instead, we have to learn a kind of a political two-step. On the one hand, we keep faith with our convictions and our principles. We don't give them up. We don't keep them silent just because they make other people feel uncomfortable. On the other hand, we populate our politics in our millions and we have to be prepared for the compromises and for the occasional defeats that will be involved um, because we are not the only people in the world with deeply felt convictions. 
and we have to deal with them. We have to find civil ways of dealing with them and make sure that we don't deal with our opponents as though they were, as though they were enemies. There's a saying on the website of something called the Institute for Civility and Government in America, which is a grassroots organization that maintains websites. Um, <laughs> and they say, I think this is a good, good saying, civility is the hard work of staying present, even with those with whom we have deep-rooted and fierce disagreements. Civility is the hard work of staying present even with those with whom we have deep-rooted and fierce disagreements. Usually one finds platitudes on these websites, but this one, it seems to me, captures something important. Staying present, I think, means that fierce political antagonism need not precipitate exit from the political process. People storming out when they've heard what others' views are. It need not precipitate either one's own exit, as in, I refuse to have anything further to deal with these people or the attempted expulsion of others. One stays with one's antagonists. One stays in the room, not turning over the furniture, but confronting one's opponents, debating with them, building shared positions with them. One shows up when it's one's turn to speak, and one listens intently when it's not, uh, even when there is a degree of discomfort in hearing other people. And sometimes, and this is the second practical suggestion I want to make, sometimes one just accepts defeat. Aristotle said that the mark of the good citizen is that he knows how to rule and he knows how to be ruled. He knows how to rule and knows how to be ruled. Citizens, he said, take it in turns to exercise authority. They have to be good at both ruling and obeying because sometimes they are in a, in a position of victory and sometimes they're in a position of defeat in a democracy. And people who cannot stand being ruled, people who cannot stand being losers in the sense that I've defined may have to be ostracized and exiled on Aristotle's account because they're people so intoxicated with their own righteousness and so intoxicated with their own authority that they cannot um, put up with um, subordination to others. Democracies in the modern world work through alternation, through the political process, the, the procedural mechanism of elections. Sometimes it's a national-led coalition that's in power. Sometimes it's a labor-led coalition that's in power. These change every six or nine years. Sometimes your party is in power or in coalition. Sometimes my party is. All politicians in the modern world have to deal with the goal of defeat. Most do so, and in this country it's evident that they do so gracefully and respectfully, doing what they can to ease the transition to the authority of their opponents. I mentioned to some of my friends at Table 3 <clears throat> a wonderful speech given by Senator John McCain, his concession speech in 2008, which you can find on YouTube, when he conceded that he had lost the presidential contest to uh, Senator Obama. And where that transition, more than any transition in recent American politics, was absolutely important that it be designed carefully to facilitate the legitimacy of the first African-American president uh, in the United States. And, and it's, it's a joy to watch how Senator McCain managed that delicate and deeply felt um, move. In a society like ours, and we take this for granted, in a society like ours, me members of the defeated party do not go on trial, or they don't have to go abroad, or they don't go into the mountains, or they don't go underground. Elections are not followed by waves of hangings, or expropriations, or suicides. Defeated opponents move gracefully to the other side of the house where they engage continuously in loyal opposition. The loyalty of their opposition is their acknowledgement for the, that for the time being, the winners have the right to govern, even though the opposition have the right to continue to criticize. Indeed, as Alexis de Tocqueville pointed out when he studied American politics, good losers actually value the empowerment of the winners. Quote, for as the minority might shortly rally the majority to its principles, the minority is interested in professing that respect for the decrees of the legislator, which it may soon have the occasion to claim for on its own. We expect the tables to turn, we expect the turn taking to carry on. And what a precious thing this is, this aspect of our political culture that we take for granted. 
business as usual and politics. Historically, how rare it is and how fragile it is. But today in the United States, I regularly get emails from an outfit that calls itself Power to Impeach, whose mission it is to remove what it calls the structural impediment to initiate impeachment proceedings against President Trump by helping to elect more Democrats to the House of Representatives. I was in Unity Books in Willis Street in Wellington yesterday, and I found there on prominent display, again going back to my line, what the hell has it got to do with you? Uh, a book by Alan Lichtman, who's an American historian, called The Case for Impeachment Against President Trump, um, claiming, for example, that his withdrawal from the Paris um, Climate Accords is a crime against humanity. Um, so six months into the administration and impeachment talk is all over the media. Or if not impeachment, then maybe removal from office under the incapacity provisions of the 25th Amendment. No doubt it would be a huge boost to the morale of the Democrats after their awful defeat last November if the president were impeached, and I feel the attraction of it as much as any other Democrat supporter. But think a few yards down that road. I gave a couple of talks in Brasilia recently. Do Americans want to become like Brazil? where removal of a president from office is rapidly becoming the routine mechanism for changing administrations. Actually, in the New York Times last week, there was a chilling reversal of this warning. A Brazilian political scientist said that Brazil is in danger of becoming as polarized politically as the United States. <laughs> <laughs> and you'll say it's a fanciful comparison because surely American politics are much more stable than their Latin American counterparts. Are they? For the first few decades of this 21st century, we had a contested election with George W. Bush against Al Gore that had to be decided by bare majority voting in the Supreme Court of the United States. We had the Bertha dispute about the credentials of President Obama to hold the office of president concerning where he was born. During the 2016 campaign, the Republicans wanted to imprison their opponent, lock her up, lock her up. And now we have ugly talk of impeachment against President Trump. What does the next step look like? Tit for tat? What's the end game? If President Trump is removed for office by impeachment or under Article 25, do we expect the GOP, the Republicans, gracefully to acknowledge the next successful Democratic victor? Fat chance. How do we walk this back, having lost this rhythm of political civility? where losers gratefully acknowledge the defeat, how do we walk it back when we've lost it? How and when do we ever revert to the civility of politics and the rhythms of politics as usual? Listen, I'm sorry that so much of this has been a letter from America. It's possible that America is a special case and you shouldn't be interested in any of this. Stephen Carter quotes Clemenceau's observation that America is the only nation in history which has gone directly from barbarism to, de to degeneracy without the usual interval of civilization. <laughs> but I do think there are lessons for us all about maintaining our equilibrium in a time of hyper-partisan populist politics. For I think we have all been thrown off balance. I'm an opponent of President Trump. I'm a New Zealander and I don't vote in the United States, but a green card holder can make campaign contributions, and I gave a considerable amount of money to Secretary Clinton. She lost, and now we have this sort of Berlusconi figure in the White House, or some combination of Berlusconi and Marine Le Pen strutting around the world, knocking over everything that isn't nailed to the floor <laughs> in, in the name of the United States. And it's my fear that the election of President Trump has thrown us all, depriving us of a certain equilibrium or a certain sense of balance and moderation. Each night we watch CNN, each night I watch CNN, expecting, let's be honest, hoping for some new disgrace or some new twist to the Russian interference scandal or some new manifestation of President Trump's clumsiness in the art of, of statesmanship. We are addicted to it and there it is, night after night, and that's all the news that's fit to present on CNN. We root for him to fail. I began these reflections and you are the first to hear them. 
when I found myself experiencing very serious discomfort or withdrawal at any legislative or policy success for President Trump, or even just a uh, foreign visit that passed off without mishap, even on matters I didn't in principle oppose, and that's not a healthy situation. So I've offered a few suggestions, mainly for the political class. Draw a clear line between campaigning and governing. Don't talk as though your opponents were enemies. Be careful about constitutionalization and drop this talk of impeachment. But incivility flows both ways. It flows from the bottom up as well as from the top down. And the tone of street level politics is pretty bad and it's incumbent on us as denizens of the street to think about a few things that might make it better. I don't know that there's any way of making it better, but we surely got to try. Micro-civility might be something that we need to take seriously. So for example, as voters and participants in politics, we have a responsibility gracefully to accept an election or result that we deplore, as we would expect our opponents to, ex to accept our victory. We ought to put down those signs that I see in New York outside Trump Tower on Fifth Avenue saying, not my president, yeah? and people march around self-righteously with those. We have to learn how to talk with others who disagree with us, or better still, listen to them, and listen, as Stephen Carter puts it, with our ears, not our mouths, not just waiting for them to draw breath so that we can pounce on the things they say that we know we have answers for in our own talking points. In the United States, I don't think this is true in New Zealand, although Alex has written a little bit about um, political and ideological segregation. Um, in the United States, engaging with others may require us to go out of our way in the circumstances of the cultural and ideological and political segregation of the country. There's an excellent book by an author called Robert Bishop, Bob, Bob Bishop, called The Big Sort, Why the Clustering of Like-Minded Americans is Tearing Us Apart. Uh, it points to the fact that even in close-run elections, many counties exhibit landslides for one candidate or the other because people are moving together with those whose education level and ideological level and church going, for example, are congenial to them. And people are dividing so that a country which is basically equally divided among political parties is gathering together into virtually unanimous um, communities, the big sort. Very good book, published in 2008. And there's a tendency of people when they move to settle, when they move to settle near others who share their convictions and lifestyle. And psychologically, we know that if you gather with like-minded people, that tends to generate more and more extreme positions as people try to reassure others of their conformity. There's a droll observation by the playwright Arthur Miller, that's the one who was married to Marilyn Monroe, at the time of the 2004 election. He said, how can the polls be neck and neck when I don't know a single Bush supporter? Yeah? <laughs> and and that's, a, that's a mark of the segregation that I'm, I'm talking about. Um, it's worse in some professions, in mine for example. David Bromwich once observed that many professors when asked will confess that it's been years since they talked about politics in a, company, in a company less than wholly composed of other academics. Family barbecues would be the only other occasion. There's some possibility of genuine mixing it up. Robert Bishop and others see religion as an intensifier of political divisions. People increasingly choose a church for its politics. But myself, living in a secular city, I go to church, to St. Thomas Episcopalian Church on Fifth Avenue, just across from Trump Tower. Not just for faith and worship, but to meet and talk with people who are politically and culturally unlike myself, and unlike the liberal academics that I mostly hang out with. I want to reshuffle the big sort to the extent that I can, and everybody ought to be trying a little bit of that um, to find their way of talking to others whose views are not necessarily congenial to their own so that they can practice talking with other people with whom they disagree. And I believe that it is only that if we practice talking to each other and listening to each other, staying present with each other in the midst of our disagreements in whatever setting we can find, only if we can do that is there any hope at all of overcoming the incivility afflicting our politics or in the happy case of New Zealand preventing such incivility from rising up and getting out of hand. So that's my letter from America. Thank you very much indeed.